Having graduated in 84 from NC State, mm -hmm. um, stayed in Raleigh for the summer until I could go away uh, in, the, um, in fall. Uh, moved to Boston and lived and worked there for five years. And uh, worked primarily with Schwartz Silver Architects in Boston and did works on uh, projects like uh, a library for the Wheeler School in Providence, the MIT Architectural Library in Cambridge, mm -hmm. um, some other retail jobs and various things. Um, and then I uh, got into uh, grad school at UC Berkeley uh, starting in the uh, fall of 89 and uh, came out here and uh, I got my de master's degree and started work. Um, well, along the way, during that uh, experience at Berkeley, I also had a chance to work in Tokyo uh, with an internship program through the school. So I worked in Tokyo and came back, finished up, and then went to work with Holt and Shaw, uh, architects in, in uh, San Francisco, uh, where I did uh, a range of things from aquariums, uh, aquariums, uh, theaters, uh, private homes, um, let's see, a lot of retail, and uh, was there for about 10 years, a number of others were unique one-off projects, some wineries, uh, but eventually left there with uh, one of the other principals from the firm, and we started, had our own firm, and uh, did that for a few years, doing retail, wineries, uh, residential design, and then uh, had an opportunity to join uh, Michelle Kaufman Designs, doing prefabricated modular homes, and I was uh, the managing, uh, managing principal of the architectural staff. And uh, uh, it's really interesting, it's doing modular homes, uh, factory built homes delivered to site and uh, with the site construction happening there. And we were covering all phases of, of that work uh, and had our own factory. Uh, so I was just sort of managing the principal of the architectural staff. Um, and actually had only been there for two and a half years uh, when I went in for surgery uh, to remove a, a tumor and it was something that we had been diagnosed maybe a month and a half into that new job and uh, went in for surgery and then unexpectedly lost all sight which then kind of had a, a, a fairly abrupt <laughs> re, retooling and refocusing of my uh, architectural career uh, but uh, at the same time I was determined to do it and actually went back to work for uh, uh, the first day, maybe a month, after, I think it was exactly a month after the after the surgery, um, figuring there's you know there are no books on how to be a blind architect, so might as well get back to work and figure it out for yourself. And uh, besides, it was really great office environment, uh, fun, energetic, really positive people. That I thought it was a good place to be rather than staying at home, waiting for the world to happen around me. So, uh, and that worked really well until the, that was 2008. And uh, so that was uh, kind of a turning time in the economy. And we were doing nothing but uh, residential construction, uh, private homes, some multifamily, but it was all residential work. And it was also sort of non, non-conforming construction. So very uh, tight lending opportunities. And so that dried up. So anyway, uh, the company folded uh, within a year of, of when I had lost my sight and eventually in December of that year it had been laid off. Um, so I uh, started 2009 in the depths of the recession trying to figure out how do you get a job as an architect at that point, especially one who had been blind for less than a year. So, um, but teamed up with a uh, business consultant, uh, business coach that I'd known for years and worked with and uh, explained what had happened, got him up to speed, and, and uh, he, he asked for a couple weeks and came back and said, uh, got a number for you to call, got an interview, and uh, turned out to be a, uh, one of his clients, and they were doing a polytrauma and blind rehabilitation center for the VA in Palo Alto. And uh, so as the architectural team, they were uh, actually found real, real value in an architect that was blind that was going through the same experience that the users of the building are going through, the veterans that are new to sight loss. 
they were there for training, the very things that I was really just wrapping up. Uh, still doing it, but pretty much done at that point. Um, so it was uh, uh, a unique opportunity to, to get in and um, sort of contribute both architecturally but through this unique experience of, of uh, dealing with site loss. Sure. And, and through that, sort of realized an opportunity to specialize in projects for the blind and visually impaired because nobody else was doing that. <laughs> nobody else had that specialty. They don't teach it in school. Uh, and uh, for the most part, you know, I've been done my research. There were uh, no other, I couldn't find any other blind architects. My rehab counselors from the Department of Rehabilitation in the state, they had been working their resources. They couldn't find anybody that was an architect that continued working after they lost their sight. And nobody to this day has gone into architecture blind. Uh, might do it blindly. <laughs> Nobody's entered the program blind that I'm aware of. Uh, so um, anyway, it just seemed like a unique place to try to figure out how to build a business out of that. Um, and so that was that was the starting in the winter of 2009, and that's worked out pretty well. The opportunities are there. It's uh, it's challenging. It's difficult. There's not a lot of opportunity. Um, but in that time, I've had our opportunities to do uh, to do that project for the VA in Palo Alto, and also um, associated, associated blind housing in New York. There's a renovation of uh, some HUD, HUD housing uh, on West 23rd with a firm in New York City. Uh, that's still pending, but uh, should hopefully get under construction sometime soon. And uh, also uh, on a project in the in North Carolina. Um, teamed with uh, HOK out of their Washington, D.C. office for the new Duke University Eye Center and consulted on that. One, one uh, really sort of lucky thing about all this, I uh, always say I've been incredibly lucky through this entire experience of both opportunity, uh, sort of relationships with people, the ability to keep working, but to, to lose your sight as an architect and 2008, you know, it's a darn good time to lose your sight. You got to do it. There's a lot of technology out there now, um, and a lot of accessible technology. So the the basic the basic stuff, you know, word processing, Excel, you know, doing spreadsheets, email, internet, all that is pretty straightforward. Um, just stand. I kept using the same computer. Just load up different. Uh, uh, systems that go with it for, as screen readers, because um, I have no no sight at all. So it just everything is a, an audible interface on the computer, um, and there's a lot you have to learn to, to do that. Uh, but it's very manageable, and the systems are, are very good. Uh, so that that part is surprisingly easy. Uh, the real trick then was well, how about architecture? How about drawings? Um, being out here in San Francisco, we have access to a lot of technology and uh, a fairly uh, high performing uh, disability uh, community of people with disabilities, many of, of whom are blind and in technology and sort of allied fields. And uh, so there's, they did a lot of work with my trainers to figure out how to get me into back into drawings. So, Within a matter of months, I was set up with an embossing printer uh, so I could take drawings done by others, but I could take them and send it to the printer and get it in tactile form. Um, so, uh, and then we found it was a pretty in, uh, involved process to get it to that. But then just on a fluke, my trainer and I, we, we thought we'd give it a try. Just what happens if someone sends us a PDF? Could we print that? And it turned out we could. And there's nothing extra, nothing new that needed to be done. Just send us a line drawing from any any drawing pro program, whether it was uh, AutoCAD, Revit, something on the Mac platform, or a sketch. Just send it as a line drawing, and I could immediately print it through the embossing printer, and I could do it all, all on my own, and then read it through touch. Um, and you know, reading, reading a drawing, through touch is very different than reading a drawing with your eyes. Uh, 
you know, if you see a drawing visually, you see the whole, the whole composition, the whole context, and then you sort of focus in on detail. And it's the reverse, uh, going by touch. You can't possibly get the whole thing. At, you're getting one little bit at a time. And you can't even sort of feel with multiple finger, fingers in both hands because you, you've got to get a, a sense of, of what this thing is and figure that out. Uh, so it took a while to sort of develop a strategy uh, for how to do that. Um, but in, in some drawings, they're just really hard. And sometimes it helps to get to some visual assistance from someone to give me some basic orientation. But generally, once I know the drawing uh, or know the project, I can get into it and work with it pretty easily. And have also discovered things that have some advantages. If I'm working with uh, a floor plan of a building, I have a much more uh, pronounced sense of being in the space. So I'm reading it with my fingers. I'm going through like the circulation system through the building or within a particular room. Um, you know, I'm physically touching the space and imagining uh, the environment around me. The technology is, an, is a, obviously it's revolutionary, revolutionizing so much of the profession and society in general. And as I was describing, you know, there's, it, it can enable incredible leaps in inclusion of people with disabilities uh, in, in the workplace, in society. Um, it's, it's really phenomenal, the difference that it can make. At the same time, it can, it, it's sort of a double-edged sword. If you do it right, it can aid uh, and, and improve inclusion. If you do it wrong, if you don't think about it in time, uh, or don't think about it at all, it can end up excluding uh, people more than ever before. Um, so there's, uh, and it's, it's surprising how often that happens. And typically it's fixable. One thing is like the iPhone. When it first came out, I had an iPhone for two and a half months when I lost my sight. And when I lost my sight, I couldn't use the phone anymore. It was an early generation iPhone and there was no accessibility feature. You just keep it in the river, it was no good. Um, within a year, uh, every iPhone uh, sold off on the, sh on the market was accessible. Every phone you buy now, iPhone you buy, buy today, is, is accessible. You just go into settings, go into general, accessibility, and choose your, choose your system of choice. There's voiceover, there's magnification, there's contrast, there's all sorts of things you can do to improve the accessibility of the phone uh, for your basic service and basic needs. And uh, so it's, and actually by the, the first iPhone I got since then, uh, I bought it in, in Raleigh at, at, the iPhone, at the Apple store at Crabtree on Christmas Eve of all things. And it was like heroically normal. I'm just another guy in the store getting a phone. And um, they set it up, transferred all my contacts and I was good to go. And it was just remarkably normal, despite getting a blind guy getting a touchscreen phone on Christmas Eve. And, and that was an incredibly powerful thing. So you could play that off any other environment, uh, any other kind of technology, service, uh, industrial design. It's like, wow, the possibilities are amazing what you can do and how simple it can be if you're thinking about it and really developing the systems. We tend to use uh, sight and vision as like, interchangeable things. And, uh, yeah, but that's hardly interchangeable in my circumstance. As I say, I can, I can be an architect without sight, but I can't be an architect without vision. Uh, but I've actually started to realize that, that uh, you know, I have perhaps better vision now working with outside in terms of a broader spectrum of, of things to consider, ways to work, people to consider, uh, sort of the, the society at large to, to uh, design for, to include in, in projects.